All right. Hey, hey, guys. Welcome to The Pig Daily, episode number 56, where we are going to be talking about Snoot's mass drone anti-Phoenix play. Uh, so this isn't one where we're going to be talking for a crazy long amount of time. It's going to be one of our shorter dailies, so it should be nice and concise. I was thinking about what do I want to talk about today, and I was like, you know, <clears throat> I really feel like doing a What If Wednesdays show, but a lot of pros are very busy qualifying for WESG, flying off to Kesper Cup right now. So I was like, all right, let's talk about another game from WCS Mexico. And I was thinking, what was a game which really blew my mind and just made me so happy to see this sort of play on such a high level? And it was definitely from the grand finals when Snoot was playing Showtime and Showtime brought out a lot of heavy Phoenix play and in multiple games Snoot countered this by building drones just massing drones and that's literally all he did for the first few minutes of the games at such an insane rate and it really showcased a very spectacular understanding of how the Phoenix works and how the Zerg economy works so Let's dive straight into game and let's start breaking this down guys because this is just such a cool way to react to heavy Phoenix play <clears throat> So this was game one, actually, of the Grand Finals. It was Apotheosis. It's a pretty good map for Zerg. Um, obviously, it's so long, and you get a nice gold base as a potential third location. So it's pretty tough for Protoss. Protoss players tend to take some risks here. <clears throat> Showtime actually opened up with a Nexus first opening, and a wall off it is natural, so we could then take a very easy third. And just using the uh, pylon overcharges up here at the... Uh, the natural in order to defend. Really sick way to play from uh, Showtime. And he goes straight into Twilight Council. And he opened up with what is a very standard 3-gate Adept Glaive attack. Actually, 4 gates. He, he did get a 4th gateway now, now that I remember that. Okay. Um, so it's actually like, okay, pretty big Adept pressure, but otherwise into a 3rd base. You know, reasonably standard stuff. And then, bam, gateways down behind it. Now, Snoot was a little bit lucky this game, which is why we do get to see a perfect response. And the reason is he's going to get a really lucky scout on these Stargates immediately because Showtime makes a little bit of a mistake. If he didn't get it, this whole strategy might not work out as well um, because of the way it works and the way... Phoenix kind of build up damage in the way economy kind of skyrockets the more you have. So we're gonna, I guess we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So what happens is he just kind of runs in with some Zerglings. This Adept was shirking its duties, just chilling out uh, over there rather than blocking the wall. So the Zerglings come on in. They see the triple Stargate and go, oh my god. And <clears throat> this is really cool because if we look back at home... There's nine roaches on the way, so Snoot is already saying, let's just defend this adept pressure with these nine roaches and go back to droning. Even if I lose some drones, like nine roaches isn't, isn't going to completely shut down nine adepts, but it'll do a pretty decent job. Um, he says, even, even if I'm not going to be able to completely shut it down, I'm going to be able to rebuild so many drones, I can replace whichever ones you kill. But behind that is what's really interesting, and already he's dropping a fourth base. So he ends up hanging on against these Adepts, they kind of shade, try to shade around a little bit. End up cancelling the shade, they focus down about 8 workers. <coughs> and 2 Adepts do get out. But already Snoot is adjusting. He's already dropping a 5th base, and all we are going to see in that production tab is a bit of upgrades and tech. <coughs> and drones, drones, drones. Notice how Snoot's also pulled off gas on his natural. He's realizing that this is going to create a very particular situation, especially because this is super Phoenix heavy, so we get to see the most exaggerated version of this scenario ever, which is perfect because I'd love to show you guys kind of the theory in its, in its pure form, and that's exactly what this game is. Uh, so <clears throat> he's just trying to get as much mineral income up as possible, already transitioning drones to his fourth. Notice he's not taking any extra gases. He's just going crazy heavy on those minerals. So let's have a think about it, guys. And this is something, even with your most typical Phoenix responses, you need to take into account. So, if you're going up against Phoenixes, same with any sort of harassment or pressure, there's always a certain response that's involved. And this is something which you need to adjust into your build or your play style. So, it's very easy with air units. Say Banshees. Uh, Banshees are the same as Phoenix. Number one, no matter what, you're going to lose 
drones that have to be transformed into spore crawlers. You're also probably going to lose th at least two or three drones, maybe four or five, unless you're like insanely on top of having your queens in position. So you can always assume you're going to lose three spore crawlers, at least one for each of your bases, and a few more drones on top of that. Now, how much does a spore crawler really cost? Keep in mind, a spore crawler is 75 minerals plus the drone that goes into it. So that's 125 minerals plus a lava per spore crawler. Not only that, <clears throat> but you've also got to think about when you invest in this anti-air and these spore crawlers. Now, a lot of people, they say, well, you lost, um, say, 10 drones here. Uh, why didn't you just build spore crawlers? In certain situations, when players choose to skip those spores, and what you need to take into account is if you lose 10 drones at the 10 minute mark, that's nowhere near as bad as losing three or four drones at the five minute mark. And this is a concept which a lot of players kind of struggle with a little bit because what you need to be thinking about is every second that goes by, these drones are mining minerals. They're harvesting more. Also, the more economy you have, you can actually imagine and you can look in, in the graphs in the post-game screen uh, at your income and you can see the way your income it goes up exponentially. It gets up, it starts increasing faster and faster. It picks up pace the more it goes, right? And that's because the more economy you have, the more economy you can build. So <clears throat> what happens is early in the game, if you get cut into your economy, it's a bigger percentage of your income as a whole, which gets knocked down. So say you're at 20 drones, you lose five drones, it's disastrous. It's a quarter of your economy. You're at 50 drones, you lose five drones, who gives a shit? You're going to replace it in no time. doesn't matter. It's a dent. It's a small dent. That's it. So <clears throat> this is something you've always got to take into account. So number one, the earlier the drones die, the worse it is for the Zerg's economy. And obviously this goes for all races, but especially Zerg because they are, they very much rely on that minerals more than anything else. So <clears throat> drones, the earlier they die, that's really bad. Um, so if you invest in a spore crawler, you need to invest in it really before the pressure hits you. About 30 seconds it takes to build, <clears throat> or I think it's like 21 seconds in in, her, uh, in Heart of the in Legacy of the Void time. Yep, 21 seconds. So that means you're investing in that extra 20 seconds before the drones would even potentially start dying, which means you're losing that bit of mining time in there and you're putting that dent in your income earlier. So investing in spores in of itself is a pretty big hiccup in your economy. Adding the fact that you're going to be losing drones and against something like Phoenix play, where even with spore crawlers, they're always going to find drones, they're always going to find units to pick off. You know you're going to lose a lot of minerals. <clears throat> and this is something... Even if you're still just going to go for Hydra's single spore at each base, you're not even going to take this many bases, you're not going to go crazy, you always need to take this into account, and you need to delay your tech a little bit, delay your gases a little bit. What we see here, though, is Snoot taking an extreme example of that slight reaction you'll see every pro gamer do, <clears throat> and saying, I'm just going to... I'm just going to delay my tech for ages. Um, other than just a couple gas geysers, which I'm going to tech up off, I'm just going to mass drones like crazy. And basically put myself in a position <clears throat> where I build my economy so fast that any dent from Phoenix harassment, any dent from me putting down lots of spore crawlers doesn't really affect the curve that much. So he's going to get ahead of the damage, basically. And this is like, it gets kind of bizarre. I don't always have the right words to explain this concept, but basically it's saying, I've got to get so many drones that I get ahead of it. And especially against three Stargate Phoenix like this, it relies on getting that damage done before the Zerg kind of gets ahead of it. If the Protoss player is doing damage and keeping the Zerg, bam, down on 40, 50 drones for a long time, just keeps picking up drones and picking them up, the Zerg simply doesn't have the money to replace them as fast as the 8 or 10 Phoenix in the sky can pick them up. The Zerg ends up kind of just stuck on this sing single point where they can't transition, they can't get more economy out, and they're just frozen. Snoot's looking to get way out in front of that damage so that he can just brush it off, replace those drones while still teching, while still building units. So let's look back in game and let's see how this plays out here for Snoot. This is, <clears throat> excuse me guys, I think I ate a dead possum last night um, or, or something like that because that's what it sounds like in my throat. Um, so these Phoenix are going to come over and they're going to start trying to do damage. Now remember eight drones already died to the adept pressure. Snoot's going two spore crawlers at each base, but other than that, already up at 73 drones and not stopping anytime soon. Now, in this particular game, he does spread a couple of creep tumors. I think it's two. Yeah, one creep tumor down that way, one creep tumor out this way, because he had an extra, extra couple queens. Some games, 
Snoot actually did this without building the extra queens at all. I believe it was Gettysburg where he didn't build any extra queens, spread any creep until like really late in the game. And he just focused on his economy. And what was really interesting about that is the idea that um, you don't really need creep necessarily. If you're just focusing so hard on economy, screw extra queens. The queens aren't really ever going to chase the phoenix off, right? Notice he's not really putting in, like, connecting spores very much. He just put one spore down there, kind of connecting. Kind of puts a spore there connecting this game. But you could, if you were in a harder position, skip these connecting spores. Skip the extra queens. Just have three or four queens. And just use the spore crawlers to guard the queens and the overlords uh, in the mineral line. And then focus everything on mass units. And use those units to be aggressive where creep spread doesn't even matter. Now what's interesting here, of course, is that if you are investing so crazily in drones, let's go back a few seconds, because you want to really be watching in case your opponent does some follow-up ground attack. In this scenario, Showtime comes with an 11 adept follow-up timing, which is actually a really big surprise. And Snoot makes a pretty big mistake with his map vision. He sends out two pairs of Zerglings. But he misses the most important path on the map, right here. And, whoops, sorry, I missed it. I was, I was going for dramatic effect there. <laughs> and we see these, these adepts are going to shade right on out. Snoot has absolutely no vision of this. And as a result, he's only got five roaches and his extra queens ready when it hits. But luckily for him, he does uh, manage to defend it quite well. But it, imagine if there was five more adepts, things could have gone really bad. So let's look at how this goes. Snoot, because he didn't have his map vision down, and he's focusing so hard on drones, he is vulnerable to this sort of sneaky follow-up adept attack. And we see his roaches actually start to get overwhelmed by these adepts. Uh, the phoenix just picked up a whole bunch of intercepting uh, of drones that were transitioning. And he then shades over here. He's going to kill off a whole bunch of Zerglings, and his Phoenix just picked off a whole bunch more drones as well. So he gets up to 16 workers killed, <clears throat> and this is a mistake from Snoot. He should have seen it coming, he should have already had these Zerglings popping out. However, <laughs> whoop de doop loses 16 drones, still has 80! And that's the advantage of just saturating 5 bases as quickly as possible. Now keep in mind, because he's going to keep taking damage, he knows he's going to need to keep replacing these drones. And he actually overdrone to that like 95 drone count, knowing he was going to be losing some. At the end of the game, he doesn't necessarily want to have 95 drones. He's going to have next to no army supply uh, for his actual fighting units. Like imagine six queens, that's 12 supply, 95 drones. You're only going to have 90 supply for army. Not that ideal, but if you're losing drones de constantly, it's better to have more drones. So once again, you're getting ahead of the curve of that damage. You're not getting knocked below your ideal count. Instead, you're getting above it. You're already mining more resources than you need. Even if you do dip below your ideal drone count, you're just going to replace those. Whoa. What did that press? Just fast forwarded 10 seconds. So we see here another 15 drones, 16 drones. He's building again because he's starting to lose a lot. But let's also look around. Notice he started mining his natural gases. Only now grabbing a gas on his third base. And he has been mining these gases on his fourth for a minute or two as well. So if we go back just a little bit. Whoa, that's, that's not the right one. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I misclicked there. <laughs> All right. Uh, you didn't miss anything. <laughs> Alright, so uh, let's go back a little bit. The reason we're going back a bit, like I said, guys, is when did he take those gases? So notice, remember early, he wasn't mining from his natural gas. He pulled off there, and he just focused purely on minerals, 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 lots and lots of patcheries. Starts getting a second evo chamber. And an infestation. Notice he can get his tech up, he can get his hive and his and his 2-2 two -two upgrades, all just off these two gases. It's only when he wants to start adding in lots of banelings and then either ultralisks or broodlords or whatever he wants to go for in late game, only then does he really need to mine a lot of gas. So remember, making sure he's just going to be able to ignore this phoenix damage, constant, constant drone production, and here we go. Puts back on his gas here, only when he's got... This was fully saturated a second ago. Fully saturated main, fully saturated natural fully saturated third, and an 
He's soon going to have a fully saturated fourth as well. He's got heaps of drones rallying over there. We can see it says 14 drones. So he actually hits almost four base saturation before going past two gases. And that is insane, guys. I cannot emphasize enough just how delayed this tech is, but how perfect this is against this. Because keep in mind, guys, what does Showtime have here? Three Stargates. Yes, he's adding plus one and some more gateways now, but really, what has he got? He's still just got four gateways. He doesn't have any tech. He doesn't have many upgrades. He's got a nice 62 probe, three base economy, but that's it. Showtime does not have robos. He doesn't have anything else up. And because Snoot got that early scout on these three Stargates, he knows that Showtime's only move from here is very inflexible. It involves lots of Phoenix, and those Phoenix have to damage Snoot's economy in order to buy Showtime the time to get his transition going. And that's something which is really very specific to Phoenix, right? Is that they're super inflexible. I would say like, even though they're this fast mobile harassment unit, they can pick up ground units, they can fight air units. They're kind of a little bit limited in their overall abilities. And it really is just about that energy meter, which puts a hard cap on how much damage they can do to ground units. These Phoenix, you know, they can't attack buildings. They can't get out of control in that way. The only way Phoenix can get out of control is by killing enough drones so that they can just keep the opponent's economy in the gutter by just continuing to get damage like that. Whereas other units, think about it, any other unit, Void Rays, Adepts, Stalkers, Zerglings and Banelings, Roaches, Ravages, if you ever find yourself with too many of these units and your opponent's being too greedy, well, you just kill them. You just win the game. You kill their bases, you kill their buildings, you, you massacre their workers. But what's so cute here is that you can actually defend Phoenix simply by having too many workers and having so many more that even if they get the maximum amount of damage, they hit that energy cap and you just kind of go like, ah, oh, hey, I still got 70 drones, get wrecked. And uh, it's just, I think it's just such a fascinating dynamic here. So especially if you do push your economy this hard, it gets really interesting. And I mean, that's part of why Showtime was doing these big follow-up adept attacks. It's because he knows Snoot's going to be greedy against it like this. And he knows that the only way he can punish that is through some sort of other unit being the finishing blow. Uh, we saw him later in the series win a game with a, I think it was Sejong Station, where he did, uh, yeah, it was Sejong Station, I think it was game five. Um, game five or six, where he um, where he did a three base. Uh, he went two get, I think two Stargate Phoenix or one Stargate Phoenix into three base, just mass like twelve gate adept and just overwhelmed Snoot. What we saw here in this game, especially on these big maps, if Snoot had better map vision, he would have crushed this adept timing. So he's you've really got to scout a lot. As the Zerg player, if you're doing this, make sure there isn't that ground attack comboed with the air army. And then you'll be fine. And we see he does start adding all these gases a little bit later. He's like, yeah, I've got five bases saturated on minerals. I can probably afford to take some gas. But because his army is mostly going to be made up of Zerglings, and he's replacing a few queens as well to add a bit of anti-air, but... Oof. He's Phoenix, man. But it's mostly going to be Zerglings in the army. He's building a few more Roaches to help be safe because he did spot these follow-up Adepts coming. This time he was a little bit better prepared. A little bit sloppy with his drone full there, losing 9 drones unnecessarily. But still up at 80 drones once again. Using his Zerglings to deny the 4th base down here over and over again. Really well done by Snoot. And Showtime suddenly without a fourth up against a six base Zerg is finding himself in a very awkward position. Once again though, oh he gets in and finds some, some workers, but the Ultras are now out. So he's going to need to find a lot more kills than that. And I think, yeah, Adrenal Glands and 2-1 upgrades are done. And uh, Snoot ends up just going into Ultras off this. Notice he doesn't need that much gas because Ultras are like the only thing that he's actually spending gas on. He doesn't even have Banelings uh, this game. Doesn't even have Banelings speed actually. I do think you could go Banelings against this. Like if you think about it, right? Yes, Phoenix are going to wreck Banelings. But you can always like morph Banelings suddenly when the Phoenix don't know where your army is. Roll in, take a big fight, and it's going to work out okay. Um, however... In this case, like Zerglings and Ultras are both fantastic because Phoenix can't lift them. Well, they can lift Phoenix, it's just an absolute waste of their energy because Zerglings are so small and so cheap. 
Um, you know, using a whole lift for a single Zergling is ridiculous. Ultras can't be lifted because they're massive units. So we see here, for instance, the Phoenix pick up these Roaches. Snoot's like, thank god, please get rid of those Roaches, man. They were useless. They don't have any upgrades. I don't think they even have Roach speed this game. So he's very happy to lose those units. And he's actually building 10 drones right now as well. Um, because he's actually low on money. Which seems kind of insane, but just a little bit more damage on his drone lines throughout this game than he probably would have preferred. And uh, he's going to try and have to try and defend here. <clears throat> so he's pulling back his Zerglings, as well as about 5 or 6 Ultras. Comes in on top of this army. Showtime doesn't quite have the critical mass. And after killing that army, the 4th base is, uh, is forfeit. There's no way Showtime can defend that. And since we're at 12 minutes, that's pretty much GG. Because the main base is now fully mined out. Natural is about half mined out. These patches are going to be mining out very soon. Oh, actually, his, it is completely mined out because it was the gold base. I forgot about that. Um, so he's actually mining on one base. Uh, he's got three base gas still, so he can make a lot of Archons. But he's just not going to have enough minerals to retake bases and so on. So Ultras and Zerglings are just going to have an absolute party super clever way of just playing against the uh, the Phoenix play. Just mass drones, goes pure units which can't be picked up by Phoenix off the back of that. And you know what? <clears throat> These Phoenix felt kind of impotent this whole game. When you kill 58 drones in a game and the Zerg never really dips below 70 drones past the 6 minute mark, then you know you're in a bad position as Protoss. Uh, so he killed so much economy so many times and let's let's not I, let's, let's not over-exaggerate. That attack up here, the game was actually still not completely over by then, by any means. And I actually think if Showtime pulled back with his army, rather than engaging there, like if we look at that fight one more time, this was not like the absolute most game over situation where Showtime needed to win right there. Realistically, uh, Protoss does get the better late game composition. And especially when you've got Phoenix still running around picking up drones 15 or 20 at a time, it does make it really awkward for Zerg. Because how does Zerg get a big army supply? The bigger the army gets... Um, yeah, the bigger the army supply gets for Protoss, the, uh, the more awkward it is um, for Zerg. Because Zerg wants to at least match that army supply. But the Zerg also wants those excess drones like I was talking about, or at least the excess bank to replace the drones to make sure the Zerg can absorb the damage from these Phoenixes harassing. If they can't do that, things do get super awkward. This snipe on that fourth there was also very big for Snoop. But at this point in the game, like I said, 64 pros are 77 drones. There is plus two attack finished for Showtime. Showtime's not in a bad position right now. If he built some more Immortals, some more Archons, Snoop's going to find himself in a very awkward position where it's all about catching Showtime out of position. So. If this is such a fantastic counter to Mass Phoenix play, why, Pig? This is the part where I ask myself, ask myself questions. Because you guys sometimes give some pretty crap questions in chat. You guys need to step your game up. Start, start shouting out questions, by the way. We're going to get to them very Into soon. Them now. And thank you, Bullia, for the sub. Appreciate no. it. But if this is such a good style, then why wasn't Snoot just grossly ahead after he had this sick economy build-up? After the first bigger depth pressure didn't really do that much damage. Keep in mind, guys, it comes back to what I was talking about earlier in the game. Snoot didn't have the best map control, didn't spot that second pressure coming, took a bit of damage from it, about 16 drones, and not only that, like that was, what, seven minutes, I think? I think it was seven minutes when the second pressure came back in. About here, so... I'm not sure if this... Okay, this was the first pressure. Yeah, so about seven minutes. We'll fast forward to that. Thank you so much for all the subs, guys. Appreciate it. But about seven minutes, he comes back with that 12 adept pressure, right? Here we go. So he's going to fly on across that map. And remember, here is where Snoot starts, starts taking a bit of unnecessary damage, which he wasn't fully prepared for. So there was some really good usage of the units there. Look at that. Lots of drones do go down. 16 drones. And not only that, but then remember when he hit the fourth up here as well. A little bit slow on some drone pulls from Snoot. Started taking a little bit of damage. And one could actually argue that maybe maybe even... No, actually, I was going to say maybe Snoot didn't have enough drones. No, Snoot had plenty of drones, guys. 
he, he, he had no he had over 90 drones but once again i don't know if he even spotted this pressure move out and um maybe he did maybe he didn't i'm not 100 sure but definitely felt like these pressures got a little bit more damage than he would have liked and i do feel like that is uh definitely where if if this damage doesn't happen snoot runs away with this game really fast but because showtime was able to find these bits of damage he kind of bought himself that time to get out the double robo production, to uh, start making Archons, plus two upgrades, all this sort of stuff. And I think that really did a, a fantastic job for him. Yeah. Really well played by Showtime. But at the end of the day, not enough. Not enough to overwhelm Snoot's sick Master own style. So guys, to summarize, before we go into questions, <clears throat> you always want to adjust around any economic damage you can foresee. In this scenario, we got to see the most extreme example. We got to see Phoenix, which we know are going to go for drones. We know they're going to do damage, and we know they're going to force Spore Crawlers. Not only that, but Snoot had early warning. He scouted them early, and he saw triple Stargate. So he knew there was no way there was money for anything else left for Showtime. He knew it was going to be just mass, mass Phoenix, and he got to show us the absolute hardcore reaction to that just two gases and just mass drones, mass hatcheries. He just built that economy like a madman. Um, keep in mind, if you're the, the player on the Phoenix side, you know it's all about cutting into that Zerg economy early enough. You might play someone who tries to do this same thing, but if they don't build their economy fast enough in the early stage and you start doing damage when they're only at 50 drones rather than the 70 drones we saw in this game, then maybe you're going to get out of control. But it's always about not just the unit interactions in StarCraft, it's about timing, it's about economy, and it's about you know how hard you can hit their economy before it kicks in. That's what StarCraft's always about. Uh, so it's making use of those aggressive timings, hitting crisp, you know, the same units, two minutes later in the game can be completely impotent. Two minutes earlier in the game, it can absolutely roll over your opponent. It all comes down to finding the weakness in your opponent's strategy and, uh, and that opening. So let's answer a few questions to finish on up. Probe said, Probe 1 says, how should Snoot have scouted the pressure lings on the map? Absolutely. We, we know, remember we pointed out earlier there were those gaps in his vision on the map uh, with Zerglings. So you always want to be not only having vision on the map, but you can aggressively poke into the Proto space. And usually if they're warping in a lot of Adepts, you're going to see it. If they're making a lot of units, you're usually going to see it. If they're sitting there with like hardly any units and there's double Robo at the third and they're just making those powerful tech units, you can be like, okay, I, don't, I can chill for a bit. You know, I'm not that worried. You see a guy warping in six Adepts, you're like, oh, build units, get ready. Um, so it's always about that map control. We pointed it out earlier. Remember, if we look here at Snoot's map vision, he's got a little bit of vision there, a little bit of vision there. And the Adepts just dive right through the middle of the map without him seeing them. So definitely just having Zerglings all over that map would be really big. The jungle Catten says pig. So what if he went void rays? Snoot had nothing against it and Showtime had three Stargates. The problem with Void Rays is they really suck against Zerglings and they're incredibly expensive and not very mobile. So while definitely Snoot didn't have an answer to the Void Rays right there and then, Snoot could very easily mass produce Queens, which do very well against Void Rays, and then add in things like Infestors and Vipers, which do fantastically. Uh, Parasitic Bomb against Phoenixes and Void Rays combined with Fungal and Queens on the ground, very, very powerful. However, Snoot maybe just ignores them, says, I've got plenty of spores, you can't actually attack into me, I'm just going to attack you from three sides with Ling Bane. And if you've ever watched Void Rays try to stop Ling Bane hitting from three angles, like Bane Banelings crash through the natural wall, you can imagine it. He's trying to take a fourth, build up his Void Ray count, suddenly Ling Bane crashing through this pylon, Ling Bane crashing through this natural wall and flooding into the main and natural doesn't matter how many lifts you've got, doesn't matter how many Void Rays you've got, you are going to struggle really hard to defend that. So definitely he'd need better Sim Cities, more cannons, sick wall offs, and he could do something like that. And then it forces a very different kind of game. Um, but it's very difficult, even with good Sim Cities, to defend against just Ling Bane hitting from many angles. In so. <laughs> I so know how Morang Maragno. That is the hardest Twitch name I have ever seen in my life. Ayosonu Morango says, Pig, would Burrow be a good thing here? It seems like a few Burrow units across the map gives a way better vision. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't be bad. Um, definitely not 100% necessary, though, because the great thing about Zerglings is it's kind of a waste for Phoenix to pick them up. 
of course, in this case, there's some Atrenix energy. Maybe they just don't care as much, but I feel like they really should. So what you can do is just leave Zerglings everywhere. And there's a tell in of itself. Whenever you're up against Phoenix play and you see Phoenixes pick up a Zergling, you know to build units. Because it's like, why the shit would Phoenixes waste their energy lifting up a Zergling on the map? It's clearly because he's trying to create a corridor where you don't have vision for him to push across the map and surprise you. So your Zergling gets picked up. You're just like, oh, build units. Send another Zergling out to double check or a few more Zerglings to, to confirm. Yep, there's, there's a big wave of Adepts coming behind those Phoenix or, or something like that. Um... Fino says, Pig, what are your thoughts about responding with mass hydras and zerglings? Do you think it depends on the map distance or question mark? Um, you know, hydras aren't really that great against Phoenix. There's this tipping point where hydras suck against Phoenix in small numbers. Um, if you get enough hydras, then you can suddenly take on Phoenix. The problem is the Phoenix are very weak against adepts. So something like charge lot uh, Phoenix or adept Phoenix actually does fantastically against Hy uh, Hydraling. So then you often need to add Banelings in as well to counteract the Adepts or, or Charge Lots. And then you find yourself finding, uh, you know, building up your Hydra Count, building up your Hydra Count. And you finally hit the point where you can overwhelm the Phoenix comfortably. And the thing is that usually coincides with your opponent getting quite close to getting out Storm or Disruptors or one of these things which just wrecks Hydras. So you find yourself, if you commit to that sort of style, having a very narrow timing attack where you need to go and kill your opponent. And because of the power of pylon overcharge, force fields, sometimes even stasis traps, it can be very hard to make that work, especially here on Apotheosis, where the map distance is so damn long. If the Protostrist is going for a fourth, doesn't just attack into you and overextend and let you wrap around, you're going to have a really hard time. Not only that, but the way Snoot's style specifically builds up is not very gas-heavy. It doesn't really cater itself towards getting out a lot of Hydras very early. Um, and that's something which I think works a lot better here. If you're going for Hydras, you need to get quite a bit of gas early, and that doesn't mesh very well with this entire response. This entire response is focused around massing your mineral income early, delaying your gases, focusing mainly just on some roaches, but mainly Zerglings, Queens, Spore Crawlers, Hatcheries and Drones, all mineral things in the early stages, and then using that four or five gas income to say, all right, now let's add some Ultras in to beef this out. Now let's add some Banelings in to beef this out. Uh, you suddenly go for Hydralisks and you're like, cool, well, I hit 70 drones, now let's add the gases. Bam, you lose 20 drones to Phoenix and suddenly your attack ends up even more all in because you can't afford to both mine the gas and have enough mineral income to replace the drones at the same time. Which is why if you're going up against a triple Stargate play, something like this, or even a double Stargate Phoenix, you definitely can make that work. But if you want to play a, something of a more balanced, long-term style like what Snoot's doing here, your eventual answer, if you want to shoot up, is going to be Infestors, it's going to be Vipers, it's going to be Queens, maybe Corruptors as well. All right. Um, how many spores is reasonable is the last question I'm going to answer there. I think that's the last really good question. I'll, I'll ask him through. Risky says, how many spores do you think is reasonable? I've had experience versus Mass Phoenix play before, and they sometimes just ignore the two spores I have and kill my entire mineral line. That's just, that's life, brother. And that's why you've got to have so many drones that you can replace it. There were multiple times in this game where the Phoenix came in, just started blasting away. I think two spores is a good number. You want them in pretty close proximity, so they're usually covering each other. So at least you are killing the occasionally Phoenix, occasional Phoenix, damaging them. Remember, the Phoenix are really just there to make it slightly harder for your opponent to harass and to protect the Queens, most of all. If they want to pick up the Queens, they've got to lose a Phoenix. However, if you're going to be, uh, you know, saying, I want to actually protect the mineral line against Mass Phoenix, you're going to need like five spores of mineral line. At that point, it's not efficient because it comes back to the equation we were talking about earlier today, which is the earlier you invest in defense or the earlier you're, sorry, not, not the earlier you invest in defense, the earlier your economy gets cut into, the more damaging it is. So if you say, he's up to eight Phoenix, I need to have those four, or five, four spore crawlers per mineral line now, that means you're investing in them immediately. That is a huge investment. Remember, each spore crawler is 125 minerals and a lava. That's a lot of money cut out of your economy. That's drones taken off minerals and put into defense. And because this hits you so early, if you want to have that defense up in time, it really just cuts into you so hard that even if you end up losing 50 drones, it's often better to lose 50 drones spread out over the next 10 minutes than it is to lose the 
equivalent of 15 or 20 drones by immediately getting the defense. You know, a lot of people's common sense says losing 50 drones is worse than 20 drones, but no, you have to be a, a, a cruel and callous leader. You need to be like, no, actually, because these 20 drones exist earlier in the game, they are a lot more valuable. So that's why usually overcommitting to defense is bad. I'd say double spore crawler per base is pretty much the absolute limit. Occasionally with a connecting spore crawler like Snoot had in this game, we saw he put a spore crawler there and a spore crawler there, just to kind of make it hard for the Phoenix to sit between his rally points and pick up drones. All right. Yeah, we got some comments from Eon Blue. Wasn't even paying attention to the episode, pointing out things that I've already said. All right, guys, we are going to finish up for today's show. Thank you so much for watching. I do want to say a big thank you to everyone who's hanging out. And uh, if you guys are keen to send in some replays and have your games cast, make sure you send in some games for my Icy Far Challenge. This week's is Striking from the Shadows. So submit your games using cloaked, burrowed, or invisible units. Um, the funnier, most more ridiculous, or creative or hilarious, the better. I have something in my eye, which is why I'm blinking a lot. Um, so thanks for hanging out, guys. That's all for now. I will be back tomorrow at the normal time. Don't forget to hug a watermelon, kick a walrus, and of course, punch a watermelon to the moon. I'll catch you guys next time. Goodbye and good night.